I looked at the faded black and white photograph that had fallen out of my grandfather's old book. I recognized my grandfather immediately. He was dressed in an army uniform, and his cap sat on his head at a careless angle. Standing next to him was an attractive woman in a long skirt, blouse, and jacket typical of the time. I looked at the back of the photo and saw the handwritten inscription. Grove and Doris, Hawaii, 1946. Grove was my grandfather's name, Grover Harrison. But to me, he was always just Pops. So who was Doris, I wondered. I knew it wasn't my grandmother. Her name was Patricia. I had never heard my grandfather mention anyone named Doris. Perhaps she was just his girlfriend from the war. I decided to ask him about it the next time I saw him, which was to be the same day. I put everything in place and headed for my apartment, which took up the entire basement of Grandpa's house. I had moved here at his insistence a few months ago when he went into a nursing home. The way he explained it made sense. He wanted someone to keep an eye on things while he was gone, and it would save me money. For several years now, my grandfather has suffered from a number of health problems. Fortunately, Alzheimer's or dementia were not among them. However, it had gotten to the point where he could no longer do the things he used to do, and since my parents had passed away, there was no one to take care of him the way he needed. Sure, he had cleaners come once a week and gardeners once a week to tend to the yard, but it wasn't enough. I did what I could, but during the week I worked. He needed constant care at this point, especially since he was now confined to a wheelchair all day long. It's not easy to move around when you're 99 years old, he said in his Minnesota accent. That's when things start to break down. So I showered, grabbed a snack, and headed to the nursing home. When I got there, I waved to the nurses at the front desk and signed in. How is my grandfather today? I asked Julie, the nurse at the desk. Frisky as always, she said with a smile. I smiled back. Did he try to stroke your ass again? I asked. Of course, she said. He does it every morning when I bring him breakfast. I laughed and headed for his private room. Hey, Trey, come on in, son, he said when I knocked on his half-open door. That's me, by the way, Trey Harrison. I walked in and gave him a manly hug. Hey, Pops, I said. How are you feeling this morning? Oh, I guess on a medium level, he said. We talked a little about various things, fishing, news, the general state of the Union. Then I pulled out a picture. What have you got there, son? He asked. I handed him the phone and watched his face change. His face reflected a multitude of emotions, sadness, anger, and maybe a little guilt. He lowered his eyes and held the picture back out. Where did you find this? He asked. She fell out of your old military handbook, I said. I was just curious who she was. I've never heard you mention anyone named Doris before. Was she a girlfriend or something? Some, okay, he said. I thought I'd gotten rid of all the pictures of her. Apparently not. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't mean to bring up bad memories. It's all right, son, he said. I think if anyone has a right to know about her, it's you. Look, why don't you get us each a cup of coffee, then close the door and I'll tell you about her. Sure thing, Pops, I said. I grabbed a cup of coffee for each of us, decaf for him, then closed the door and sat back down. As I got up, I turned on the audio recorder on my phone, hoping I had enough space to record the whole thing. Thanks, son, he said as I handed him the cup. He gathered his thoughts for a bit before continuing. Just so you know, you're the only person I'm telling this to. I don't care if you write it down for yourself, but it is absolutely not to be repeated to anyone, ever. Do you understand me? Sure, Pops, I said. I'm writing it down, but it's just for me. Good, he said. He took a sip of coffee and looked up for a moment before continuing. Grove's narration, transcribed from the audio recording. Perhaps I should start at the beginning. I was halfway through my junior year of college when the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. Like everyone else, I went to enlist in the army. Unfortunately, I was unable to do so because of my flat feet. They had never bothered me before, but I didn't argue. So I went back to school and got a degree in physics. After I graduated in 1943, I was approached by the government, if you can believe it. Said they needed my expertise for a new project. Apparently, my flat feet were no longer a problem. So I agreed and signed my name. 
I quickly went through officer candidate school, was promoted to second lieutenant, assigned to the Army Corps of Engineers, and was assigned to Project Manhattan. I was shocked when I was told what it was. Who would have thought of using nuclear material to build a bomb? It was an exciting time. I got to work with some of the most famous scientists of the time, including J. Robert Oppenheimer and Enrico Fermi. I learned more from them than I did during my entire college years. I was one of over 400 people at the Alamogordo test site when the first bomb test was conducted. We didn't even know if the damn thing would work. But it did, and the world changed that day. I was sent to Tinian, an island in the Pacific, where I was to help set and load the bomb that would be used on Hiroshima. We all hoped it would work and force the Japanese to surrender. The bomb did work, but they did not surrender. Three days later, we sent another bomb, this time to Nagasaki. We all realized that the stakes were high. If the bomb didn't work, or if the Japanese didn't surrender, we would have to send our guys in to take the country by force. And if that happened, we knew the casualties would be extremely high. Fortunately, it worked. The next day, the Japanese offered to surrender. On August 12th, the United States said it would accept the surrender offer. In early September, the official surrender ceremony took place. I stayed on Tinian for a while and participated in the damage assessment of the Nagasaki attacks. I still have nightmares about it. It wasn't just the physical damage that tormented me. It was bad enough. I saw the survivors and what they had to face. Yes, I was proud that I helped end the war, but I wasn't proud that the two bombs I helped deliver to Japan killed over 100,000 people. That still bugs me to this day. I filed reports, and in February 1946, I was transferred to the unit that became Army and Navy Joint Task Force No. 1. About the time news broke about a Soviet spy group in Canada, causing a bit of a stir. I went to Hawaii and vacationed there for a while, and that's where I met her. She introduced herself to me as Doris Hastings, originally from Norman, Oklahoma. She was a delightful woman and very beautiful. We spent a lot of time together, dancing and kissing on the beach. Of course, she could do more than dance. The things this woman did with her mouth drove me crazy. We had what you might call a whirlwind romance, and we were married before a justice of the peace in April 1946. Later that year, I participated in Operation Crossroads, which consisted of two nuclear tests at Bikini Atoll. A third test was planned, but it was canceled. In 1947, I re-enlisted in the service and was assigned to a joint nuclear testing operation in Nevada. Doris and I moved to what was then the city of Las Vegas, as it was only an hour away from where the new test center was to be located. Believe me, it was nothing compared to what it is now. Anyway, we went on with our lives, and I thought everything was fine between us. But one day, coming home from a test site, I saw Doris's car parked at a motel on the outskirts of town. I think it was 1948. My memory isn't what it used to be. What was she doing there, I wondered. I could think of only one reason why she might have been at the motel, and it wasn't a good one. I stopped recording when the nurse knocked on the door. My dad and I looked up and saw a young woman enter the room. She walked up to my grandfather and smiled at him. Are you ready for therapy, Mr. Harrison? She asked. Only if you take me, he said with a smile and a wink. I couldn't help but smile as I watched the old man flirt with the young nurse. She smiled back and unlocked the wheels and started nudging him towards the door. I'm going to be a little busy for a while, son, he told me. Come back tomorrow and we'll talk some more. Sure, Dad, I said, hugging him goodbye. Take care of my grandpa, I said to the nurse. Sure, she said. I left the room and headed home. I went through his things, trying to find any information about this woman, but found nothing. I looked through all of his old papers, seeing lots of commendations, certificates, awards, but nothing that even mentioned this Doris. Not an old marriage certificate, not any records related to the house in Las Vegas. Of course, if there was anything left, it's probably long gone by now, I thought. I looked at my watch and remembered that I had a date with Karen that evening, so I packed up and went to pick her up. We had been seeing each other exclusively for the past few months, and I was almost ready to pop the question to her. She looked good as always, wearing a fairly short green dress that emphasized her eyes and fiery red hair. She was also showing off what Daddy called great buttocks. As we sat in the Texas Roadhouse restaurant and ate, she looked at me with concern. Are you okay, Trey? She asked. You seem like you're a million miles away. 
I went to see my dad today, I said. Is he all right? She asked. Yeah, feisty as always, I said. What's the problem? She asked, expressing concern. I found this today in one of his old books from the war, I said, pulling the picture out of my pocket. She looked at it for a moment before she spoke. Is that your grandfather? She asked. I nodded my head. A handsome man. I can see where you get your looks from. He reminds me of the actor Errol Flynn. Who's the woman with him? Her name was Doris. Dad said he was married to her before he married my grandmother, I said. Funny, I don't remember him ever mentioning her before. My parents never mentioned her either. I looked but couldn't find anything in his things that mentioned her. No letters, no notes, no cards, nothing. And you know how he holds on to everything. That sounds like a mystery to me, she said. So, are you going to play Sam Spade now? I laughed. No, but I'm curious, I said. I mean, what happened to her? I have people I know who make a living searching public records, she said. I can make a couple calls and see what happens if that helps. If he was married to this woman, we should be able to find something. What was her name? He said it was Doris Hastings, and she's supposedly from Norman, Oklahoma, I said. If there is something, I'm sure we can find it, she said. That would be great, I said. Thank you. You're welcome, she said with a smile. So, what did your grandfather do during the war? He says he was involved in the Manhattan Project, I said. Isn't that the group that dropped the bomb on Japan? She asked. I nodded my head. Wow, she said. Yes, I said. He's never talked about it before. I know he worked for the government until the late 60s and then went into teaching. That's where he met my grandmother. Hmm, Karen said. Interesting. We left that topic and finished dinner, then went out for drinks, dancing, and finally back to my house, where she reminded me again why I found her so alluring and sexy. The next morning she woke up early and headed upstairs to make us a light breakfast. I rolled out of bed and went upstairs after doing my morning chores and throwing on my robe. As I went upstairs, I saw her in just her apron buttering some bagels. Pressing myself against her firm and appetizing rear end, I kissed her. Watch this, she said laughing. She handed me a bagel, which I gladly accepted. I poured each of us a cup of coffee, and we sat down to eat in the breakfast nook. Why are you up so early? I asked. Well, I need to get home to get ready for work, she said. I knew she worked at the DMV office. Her job had her in front of people most of the day, renewing car registrations and the like. Why don't you move some stuff in here so you don't have to leave so early? I asked. Trey, that sounds almost like a commitment, she said with a smile. Are you sure about that? Absolutely, I said, kissing her hand. I could get used to waking up with this every morning. Yes? she asked. Well, you know what they say about redheads, right? You've never seen me lose my temper. Then I'll have to be on my best behavior, I told her. Damn right, she said with a smile. I guess we could try it if you really want to up the ante. So, what's on your plate tonight? I have a server installation this morning, I said. If all goes well, I'll be done with it in about two hours and then I'll go see Paps. I want to hear more of his story. Okay, she said. Don't forget. I'll be at my mom's after work. She promised to help me with something I'm working on. I'll call you tonight, okay? Sounds like a plan, I said. Tell your mom I said hi. I will, she said. Mom really likes you, you know. Yeah, I like her too. She reminds me of you for some reason, I said, making her laugh. Are we still working this weekend? She asked. Remember when you promised to take a rematch from me at the miniature golf course? Sure, I said. Maybe we can visit Daddy if you want. Of course, she said. You know all he does is look at my feet, right? I ran my hand down one of her legs. Can you blame the old man? asked I. I like to look at those legs myself. You're such a naughty boy, she joked. Only with you. I said, eliciting a smile. 
After we finished breakfast, she went downstairs, put on her clothes, and walked out. I kissed her at the door and watched her get in her car and drive away. I went back into the kitchen and poured some cereal into a bowl. Karen was a wonderful woman, but she ate like a bird. I finished my cereal and went downstairs to get ready for the day. I only had one server to install, and that suited me just fine. I had been self-employed as an IT consultant for the past few years, mostly doing work for various computer manufacturers. They would provide the equipment, set up appointments, and I would do the work, as well as the maintenance that the client agreed to. The customer paid the manufacturer and the manufacturer in turn paid me. The hours were good, the pay was great, and I liked the boss, a man whose face I saw every morning in the mirror. The installation went as I planned, and by 14 o'clock, everything was ready and working as it should. The customer signed the statement of work, satisfied that the new system was installed. I jumped in my work truck, scanned the paperwork with the portable scanner, emailed it to the manufacturer, and headed to Paps. Hey, Dad, I said, hugging him. How are you doing? Oh, medium pace, I think, he said in that accent I loved so much. I suppose you want to hear more about Doris? Yes, I said. If you don't mind? Of course, he said. Have some coffee and I'll tell you some more. I poured each of us a cup of coffee and put his cup in the holder attached to his chair. I sat down and started the recorder. So where was I? asked Pops. You just saw Doris's car for the first time at the motel, I said. Oh, yes, he said. He closed his eyes and thought for a moment before continuing. Grove continues his narrative. After seeing Doris's car outside the motel that first day, I went home distraught. She had never let me know that she was unhappy in our marriage. She was always loving and warm. I didn't even realize there was a problem. I guess, I thought. I guess it's true that the husband is always the last to know about these things. I knew I needed to get more information before I did anything rash. First, I needed to act normal, and that wasn't easy. I was hurt, humiliated, and more than a little upset. It would be very difficult for me to react normally to her if she was actually cheating. I also knew I had to take decisive action, given the delicacy of my position. Something like this could be used against me by a hostile foreign power. I had gone through all the security briefings and had heard that this was the kind of thing the Reds liked to use as blackmail. I took out the phone book and looked up private investigator. I called one named James Hamm and spoke to his secretary. She put me through to him and I made an appointment with him for the morning. The next call was to my boss. I explained the situation to him and he agreed that I needed to deal with it, so he gave me the day off. Shortly after I finished talking, Doris drove up to the house. She came in with a bag of groceries and set it on the kitchen table. I looked closely but didn't see anything unusual. Her clothes looked fresh, her makeup wasn't messed up, and her hair looked as good as the last time I saw her. She came over and kissed my cheek, and I didn't smell anything strange. So, how was your day? She asked. Okay, I guess, I told her. Even though she was my wife, I was forbidden to give details of my work, so I often spoke in generalities. Just taking care of things as they come. How about you? Same thing, she said. Did some shopping, then went to the store and got something for dinner. So you didn't go anywhere or meet anyone today? I asked. No, nothing else, she said. Why? I couldn't believe it. She had just lied to my face. How long has she been lying to me like that, I thought. Oh, nothing. I'm just curious, that's all, I said. Shit. Shit, shit, shit. What do you have in store for tomorrow? Probably the same, she said. I bet it is, I thought to myself. I changed into civilian clothes and joined her at the table for dinner. After dinner, we took some sherry and sat down to watch television. We had bought one of the first mass-produced televisions, an old RCA. In those days, there wasn't as much exciting stuff as there is today, but we enjoyed the old craft television theater. Milton Berle was a favorite of ours, too, and I always liked the old Superman and Life of Riley series. The old hidden camera came out around that time, too, I think. They don't make those anymore, I'll tell you that. Anyway, we watched a little TV and then went to bed. It was hard for me to try to be the same with her that night, but I managed. I think Doris noticed that something was wrong, but she didn't say anything. The next day we had breakfast as usual. I put on my uniform, grabbed a cup of coffee, and headed outside. 
I didn't want her to think I was doing anything different, so I stopped at the diner for a coffee before meeting James. I got to his office and was ushered in by a blonde woman chewing gum in the reception area. James looked up when I walked in, stood up and shook my hand. He sat back down, lit a cigarette, and looked at me through the smoke. So, what can I do for you today, Captain Harrison? He asked, referring to my rank, looking at the papers on his desk. I told him about seeing Doris's car at the motel and explained that my job was very sensitive without specifying exactly what it was. So, you suspect your wife is running after you and you want me to get to the bottom of it, right? He asked. Yes, it is, I said. All right, he said. Give me everything you have on her a picture, make of car, license plate number, and so on, and then give me a week or so to see what I can come up with. I like to know as much as I can about her, so I'll call my colleagues in Hawaii and Oklahoma and see what we can come up with. It'll take a few days and cost a little more if that's okay with you. Yes, of course, I said. Don't forget that we didn't have all those fancy gadgets and gimmicks that you young people take for granted today. No Siri. In those days, a detective had to work hard to get the goods. I gave him information about her car, color, make, and license plate number, and then I handed him a picture. The one you found. He furrowed his eyebrows, looking at it. I didn't understand why at the time, but I would later. Okay, James said. In the meantime, don't do anything stupid. Let me do my job. It could be nothing. Maybe she's seeing an old friend or family member. Are you thinking about divorce? I don't know, I said. I guess it depends on what you find out. Okay, he said, holding out a business card to me. This is the name of a lawyer I highly recommend. My secretary will handle my prepayment. I'd like to have some kind of prepayment to get started, and then I'll bill you for the rest when I'm done. Deal? Yeah, it's okay, I said. Call me in, say, ten days and I'll have a full report, he said. Thank you, Mr. Ham, I said. You're welcome and good luck to you, Captain, he said, standing up and extending his hand to me. I shook it, then walked out and settled in at the receptionist's desk. I looked at the card and asked for directions, which the receptionist happily provided. I pulled up to a small house on the edge of downtown that had a sign on it that read, Wilbur Capshaw, attorney at law. Divorces are settled quickly here. In those days, Nevada was considered the divorce capital of the country. I parked and went inside, where another blonde secretary ushered me into the office of Wilbur Capshaw Esquire. I couldn't help but wonder if blondes grow on trees here. Wilbur stood up, shook my hand as I entered, and asked me to sit down. What can I do for you, Captain? he asked. Well, I said. I'm thinking about getting a divorce and wanted to know what my options are. You've come to the right place, he said. Are you looking for a quick Reno-style divorce? I'd like it to be quick, I said. I can easily handle it, he said. On what grounds do you want a divorce? Probably adultery, I said. I'm not sure yet. Oh, he asked. Why not? Well, I don't have conclusive evidence yet, I said. I had someone check it out for me. By someone do you mean Mr. Ham? he asked. He called and said you might come in. I've got a lot of business from him. Yes, I said. He nodded his head. So how does it work? I asked him. How long have you been here in Nevada? he asked. A few months since I was assigned here last year, I told him. Good, Wilbur said. So there's no problem with residency. According to the law, you only have to have lived here for six weeks. Can you get someone to testify that you've been here all that time? Absolutely, I said. Even better, he said. Basically, it works like this. Once you decide to do it, come to me. I'll prepare the paperwork, file it with the court, and deliver it. And then I'll hire an attorney in Reno to go to court with you. You will have to get there on your own, either by car or train. I suspect you already have a car, right? Yeah, I know, I said, nodding my head. You will then enter the courthouse. You or your attorney will state your case, and if she doesn't contest it, you will walk out a few minutes later a free man with a divorce decree in your hands. Later, if you want, you can even throw your wedding ring into the Truckee River. Just like that? I asked. 
pretty much, he said. Well, I want to see what Mr. Ham finds first, I said. I understand, Wilbur said. You don't want to get off halfway. But just so you know, you can still divorce her. Hell, I know a guy who divorced his wife because she wouldn't let him listen to the radio. Wow, I said. Yes, Wilbur said. He called it cruelty, if you can believe that. Take your time, make sure it's what you need, and then come see me. I'll still be here. Thank you, Mr. Capshaw, I said. Perhaps I will. My pleasure, Captain, he said as he stood up. We shook hands and I left. Back in the car, I realized it was time for lunch, so I went back to the diner to eat and contemplate my actions. I ate my lunch and pondered what I had done wrong. I always put her above me and did my best to treat her with respect and love. How could she do something like this? Before I knew it, it was two o'clock in the afternoon. I couldn't sit here all day, and I didn't feel like getting drunk at all. I had an idea and headed for the exit, paying the bill and leaving a nice tip for the waitress who had been so patient with me. I drove past the motel where I'd seen her parked before and didn't see her car. Good, I thought. I decided to drive home and surprise her. But when I pulled up to our house, I saw a strange car with California license plates parked in the driveway. I pulled into the driveway and parked next to Doris's car, then headed for the door. Dad and I looked up when we heard a knock on the door, interrupting his story. I turned off the tape when a nurse came through the door. Time to get you ready for dinner, Mr. Harrison, she said affectionately. He smiled back at her. All ready? He asked. God, time flies when you're having fun. I stood up and hugged Paps. Then I'd better go, I said. I'll come tomorrow if you don't mind. That's more than good, son, he said. See you later. I nodded to the nurse as I left and headed home. Once there, I checked my schedule for the next day, which was Friday. I didn't have any installations scheduled, but I did have some maintenance work scheduled that could be done remotely. I sat down at my computer and started searching. I found some old articles mentioning James Ham and learned that he had served in the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, during the war. The OSS, as I knew from a documentary I once saw on the History Channel, was the predecessor to the CIA. I also found mention of Capshaw, a divorce lawyer who made a lot of money in the 1940s and 1950s from quick divorces. Don't get me wrong, I never had any reason to doubt my grandfather. I just wanted to find something, anything at all, to corroborate his story. After dinner, I got a call from Karen. She was at her mother's house working on some project of her own. She loved to crochet and often turned to her mother, who was an expert for help. So how did it go with your grandfather today? She asked. That went well, I said. I'll probably come by tomorrow afternoon when I'm done. Okay, she said. Don't forget we have a date tomorrow night. How could I forget something like that? I asked. To this, she giggled. By the way, my mom said to say hi to you, she said. I heard her mom in the background yell out, Hi, Trey! I laughed. Say hi to your mom, I said to Karen. I heard her turn to her mother. Trey said to tell you hi, mom, she said, and turned to the phone again. By the way, Trey Harrison, she began. I love you. I know I don't tell you this as often as I should, but I love you. I love you too, Karen, I said. Karen had been hurt a lot in the past, and she wasn't the type to express love on short notice. I felt truly blessed that she felt as if she could say that to me. And in fact, I really did love her. I'll see you tomorrow night, okay? She asked. I'll see you then, I said. We said goodbye and ended the conversation. The next day I finished work earlier than I had anticipated. I checked my schedule for the next week, sent in my timesheets to get my paycheck, and went to see Paps. I wanted to hear the rest of his story. When I arrived at the nursing home, I said hello to Julie, who smiled as I checked in, and then went to his room. I gave him a proper hug and poured them each a cup of coffee, placing his cup in a coaster. So, how are you doing with that redhead? he asked. What's her name? Karen? Yes, Dad, this is Karen, and things are going really well between us, I said. Are you thinking about marrying her? my dad asked. I nodded my head. I think so, Pops, I said. He nodded his head and smiled. 
You know, I wouldn't mind if you wanted to move it to the old place, he said with a wink. You mean living in sin? I asked sarcastically, feigning shock. He laughed. I may be old, but I'm not stupid, he said. She's a good influence on you, son. And I know your grandmother would approve too. Thanks, Dad, I said. I just wish Mom and Dad were still here. He smiled and patted my knee. I know, son, he said. I do too. But it's time for you to look to the future. And I think Karen should be a part of that future. But that's not why you're here, is it? I smiled. He leaned back and closed his eyes for a moment. Let me see, where was I just now? You just pulled up in front of your house and saw a strange car out front, I said. Having read several stories on the internet, I was well aware of the ordinariness of the strange car outside the house, as many authors had included it in their stories. Oh yeah, he said. He gave me a moment to start recording before continuing. I parked the car and took a deep breath before entering the house. What will I find there, I thought to myself. Will she be in his arms? Would they have sex in my bed? I worked up the courage to get out of the car. I entered the house not knowing what I would find there. When I went inside, I saw a tall, well-built man in a dark suit sitting on a couch. He stood up when I came inside. Doris was in the kitchen making dinner. She came out when she heard the door open, and I saw her wiping her hands on the apron she wore over her house dress. Grove, you're back early, she said. I was just starting dinner. Please meet my cousin Michael J. Smith from Ardmore, Oklahoma. Mike, this is my husband Grove. The man held out his hand and I reluctantly shook it. I noticed the lipstick residue on his lips and noticed the small scar across his right cheek. Nice to finally meet you, he said in flawless English. I thought that being from Oklahoma, he might have a slight Western accent, but that was not the case. That struck me as rather odd. But then again, I didn't meet people from Oklahoma that often. Nice to meet you, Mike, I said. Please have a seat. I'm just going to get rid of this uniform, if you don't mind. Not at all, he said with a smile. Something about that smile made me wary. Don't ask me what it was, but I felt uneasy. I opened the door to my office and put my briefcase on the floor, double-checking to make sure it was locked. I closed and locked the door and then went to my bedroom to change. I listened to see if I could hear what they were saying, but I didn't. I looked around, but saw no sign that they were doing anything here. I changed into my uniform and went back to the front room. I poured myself a drink and noticed that Mike had already helped himself. I hope you don't mind, he said. Dora said I should help myself. Since you are her cousin, I see no need to state otherwise, I said. What's the saying? Mi casa es su casa. Mike looked confused for a moment before responding. Hadn't he heard that before? Well, thank you, he finally said. We sat in the front room, and Doris stayed in the kitchen. So what do you do, Mike? I asked. And what brings you to Las Vegas? Well, I'm a salesman, he said. I spend a lot of time on the road. And I was just passing through here on my way to Reno. I'm sure it's not as interesting as what you do, he added, trying to encourage me to brag about my job. Oh, I don't know, I said. You travel a lot. You see new things all the time. And I'm stuck in the same old pile of dirt every day. So what are you selling? Mostly building materials, he said. Nothing retail. Everything for contractors. You'd be surprised how much was built after the war. I noticed the scar, I said. Were you in the war? Yes, he said. I got it from a kraut bullet. Were you in the war? Yes, I told him. I spent time in the Pacific Theater. I'm sure I didn't see as much combat as you did in Europe. He shrugged. We all did our part, he said. Doris came out and called us to the table. We sat and ate, and I think I studied them almost as much as they studied me. I couldn't help but wonder if they were really cousins or if it was just a story they told me to throw me off. When we finished, Mike stood up and kissed Doris on the cheek. I noticed the way she looked at him. Something about it didn't feel right. It was delightful, he said. We'll definitely do it again. He turned to me and held out his hand, which I accepted. I should be going now. Thank you for letting me share dinner with you, Grove. It was a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, I said.
After he left, I helped Doris clear the table, and then, after pouring each of us a drink, I sat down in the front room. Nice guy, your cousin, I said as she sat down. Yes, thank you, she said. You two seemed very close, I said. We've always been close, she told me. You bet we have, I thought. I haven't seen him since he went off to war. Hmm, I said. She looked at me strangely for a minute. You seem preoccupied with something, she said. Is everything okay? Sure, I said. Just thinking about something that came up recently. But I'll deal with it. She smiled and hugged me as if nothing had happened. For the next few days, I was on alert, waiting to see what James would find out. Of course, I gave him all the information about Mike's description and the car he drove, as well as the California license plates. He nodded his head in thanks when I was done. Thank you, Captain Harrison, he said. That's very helpful. A few days later, I called James to see if he had any information for me. As a matter of fact, yes, Captain, he said. Would you mind stopping by on your way home from work today? I'll be there, I said. I got out a little early and went into his office. His secretary ushered me inside right away. Good to see you, Captain, he said, lighting a cigarette. So what did you find out? I asked anxiously. A few things, he said. First, my colleague in Hawaii checked the paperwork. Did you see the judge who married you sign the marriage license? No, I said. When I looked at it, it was signed. He said he'd file it for me. Turns out there was no marriage certificate, James said. Never. In fact, the judge who supposedly married you was found dead of a gunshot wound a few days after your wedding. The truth is, according to the authorities, you were never married. What? I asked. That's not all, he said. The woman you know as Doris Hastings is actually Russian. Really? I asked. Are you sure? Absolutely, he said. I thought I recognized her face from the photograph you gave me. Her real name is Svetlana Fedorova, and she's a KGB agent. The last time I saw her was in Bavaria at the end of the war. I thought she'd been killed, but apparently not. The man you know as Michael Smith is actually Michelle Schmidt, a former member of the Waffen SS. There was talk in intelligence that he was recruited by Fedorova as a double agent and moved to the Soviet Union after the war. Wow. I said. Maybe we'd better call the FBI or someone. Generally speaking, I would agree, James said. But I'm afraid it could get you into a lot of trouble. Being duped by a Soviet spy won't reflect too well on your record. It could also cost you your security clearance and possibly your job. But I had no idea she was Russian, I said. Never mind, James said. I suspect they've chosen you for something. What exactly, I don't know but I do know that they plan to kill you when they're done. I can also tell you that they've been quite active. He pulled out some black and white photos of the two of them, naked, in a motel room. Where did you get them from? I asked. It's better you don't know, James said. But that's the least of your worries. Since your marriage isn't officially registered, there's no way you can divorce her. So what do we do? I asked. I have an idea that will take care of everything, he said with a sly smile. We talked and made plans for the next hour or so. Daddy stopped talking and looked up at me before he spoke. I saw a tinge of guilt and shame on his face. I stopped the tape. Everything all right, Pops? I asked. This next part is the hardest part in this whole story, he said. I hope you won't think badly of me after this. Dad, there's nothing you can say to change the way I feel about you, I said. He nodded his head. I hope you are, son, he said. I want you to know I'm not proud of what I did. It's okay, Pops, I said. All right, son. Here we go, he said. I started the tape again and waited for him to finish. I waited for the day of the next challenge, just as James and I had planned. He looked after Doris, Svetlana, and Mike and knew their routines well. Apparently, Mike had a motel room, and Doris went to see him almost every day. I called James, and he informed me that the two of them were in a motel room and would probably be there for a few hours. It was not unusual for me to come home in a government truck. 
I used it a lot in my job when preparing test sites. You see, part of my job was to make sure everything was ready for each test. That meant I was the last one on the pad before detonation. When James told me where they were, I made sure I had the gear we had discussed earlier. I headed to the motel and met up with James. Luckily, their room was on the second floor and in the back of the motel. No one would see us enter or leave the room, he said. As we had planned, I wore green coveralls and a cap, so no one would recognize me as an army officer. Shh, James said as I climbed out of the car. They're asleep right now. Get everything ready while I put them down. I nodded my head and quietly opened the back door of the truck. I pulled out the ramp and attached it to the back of the truck and then opened the metal crate that was already standing inside. When I turned around, James was holding Doris Svetlana in a burlap sack over his shoulder. He tossed her into the crate. Is that her? I began. He shook his head. No, but she'll be gone for a few hours, he said. I'll be right back. A few minutes later, he returned with Mike and put his body in the box next to hers. Then he gathered up all the things that were in the room and put them in the box. I watched as he cuffed their hands behind their backs, making sure the chains were intertwined. He also stuffed their underwear in their mouths. I closed the box and locked it shut. They were so tightly crammed in that there was no way to move, much less escape. Finished with my work, I looked at my watch. Do you have time to get back before the exam? He asked. I nodded my head. Oh, yes, I said. Let me know how it went, he said. I thanked him and left while he wiped down everything he touched. I arrived at the test site just in time to be escorted out by the military police. I thought you weren't going to make it, Cap, one of the guards said. Just wanted to grab a bite to eat before the test, I said. They quickly peered into the back of my truck and waved me over. Take care, Cap, the guard said and saluted. I saluted him back and headed inside. I made my way to the tent where the weapons were being prepared for testing. After finishing my part of the job, I sent everyone else on their way as usual. Fortunately, I was able to park my truck so that my movements would not be visible from the camera set up a few miles away. After making sure everyone else was gone, I drove the truck up to the tent, opened it, then lowered the ramp and took the dolly. It took some fiddling, but I managed to center the crate on the dolly. It wasn't easy, let me tell you. Doris Svetlana didn't weigh that much, but Mike weighed as much as I did, if not more. I finally pulled out the box under the scaffolding that held the weapon and noticed that there was a metal plate running along the scaffolding underneath the bomb, probably to support the structure. At least it was hiding what was under the weapon, which was all I cared about. I unlocked the crate and opened it slightly. They started to wake up and blink their eyes a few times before they recognized me. They were both very surprised to see me when I knelt down over them. So, I said, I understand you wanted a good look at our atomic technology. Well, here you go. It's really not much more powerful than the bombs we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it'll do. If it's any consolation, you won't feel a thing when it goes off. One second you'll be here and the next you'll be gone. That's it, I added, snapping my fingers. I realized that Dora Svetlana wanted to say something, so I pulled the gag out of her mouth. You imperialist pig, she hissed. I shoved Mike's underwear back into her mouth and laughed. You lying, cheating communist bitch, I said in reply. I know all about you and Comrade Schmidt. You have about 15 minutes to come to terms with what you commies worship. By the way, I want a divorce. Goodbye and enjoy hell. Her eyes widened as I slammed the drawer shut and locked it shut. I knew there was no way they could escape. After replacing the cart, I removed the tarp tent and stuffed it into another metal box then loaded it into my truck like I always did. I took one last look around and then left the site the same way I came in, just like I always did. My hands were shaking and everything inside was shaking. When I reached the guarded observation deck, I took a few deep breaths and calmed down a little before I parked the truck and stepped inside. I joined the rest of the observers, grabbing my protective gear, and we took the usual precautions. Soon I heard the countdown and realized that in a few seconds all hell would break loose. And so it did. I knew that Doris Svetlana and her accomplice had already vaporized and would never be seen or heard from again. Like everyone else, I waited a bit before looking, and then I saw a mushroom cloud rising into the sky. Using binoculars, I looked at what was supposed to be ground zero. I don't know why, I knew there would be no evidence of what I had done there, yet I was compelled to look. 
When everything quieted down, I went through the monitoring stations like everyone else, then returned the truck and got into my car. I was still shaking when I got home. I had never done anything like that in my life and I knew I was going to hell. It's over, I told James when I called him from home. All right, he said. Give it a day or so, then report her missing. If you need to talk, let me know. I will, I said. Thanks for everything, he laughed. Wait until you get my bill, he said. I laughed for the first time that day. Dad stopped talking and looked at me, guilt and sadness in his eyes. I stopped the tape. It's okay, Pops, I said, hugging him. You said yourself that they were planning to kill you when they were done. Not only did you save your life, but you protected the country from two hostile foreign agents. You have nothing to be ashamed of. He nodded his head. I've been telling myself that ever since, he said. And it still weighs on me, you know. I know, Dad, I said. But we were at war, remember? You did what you had to do. It was either you or them. And personally, I'm glad you did. Otherwise, you and I would never have met. As I looked at him, a tear appeared in his eyes and he smiled. I never thought about it, son, he said. You know, you're the bravest man I've ever met, Pops, I said. I'm proud of you. He hugged me tightly and I felt his tears soak my shirt. After a few minutes, he wiped his eyes and looked at me. The guilt and sadness was gone. Maybe telling you about it is what I've needed all these years, he said. I've been carrying it around ever since. I'm curious, I said. What happened next? I waited a couple days and then filed a missing persons report, he said. They came back a few days later and said her car was found at a motel, but they found no sign of her. They said she may have met someone and left with them. They said I'd probably never hear from her again. We both laughed. That would have been one hell of a phone call, I said, making him laugh out loud. What happened after that? A few months passed, and at James's suggestion, I went to Capshaw's, he said. James and I decided it would be best for me to act like the marriage was real, even though we knew it wasn't. Capshaw filed for divorce, citing being abandoned. I drove to Reno, and in a few minutes it was settled. On the way out of town, I stopped and threw the ring into the Truckee River as he had suggested. For the next few years, I was halfway expecting federal agents to come to me, but they never did. In the 1960s, I retired from government service and took a job as a teacher. That's where I met Patricia. The rest is history. How did she keep in touch with her superiors? I asked. He shrugged. I don't know, he said. And I never found out. I guess it doesn't matter now, does it? I guess not, I said. Our visit was interrupted when a nurse knocked on the door. She came in and announced that it was time for dinner, and I said goodbye. Be sure to bring your charming girlfriend to us, he told me. I will, Dad, I said. Maybe tomorrow if you don't mind. I'm looking forward to it, he said. That night Karen and I went out for dinner, drinks, and dancing. She took a few things with her, including a large paper bag with something inside that she said was a surprise. Later, after we made love in my apartment, she turned to me. Are you okay, Trey? She asked. Yeah, why do you ask? I asked her. Well, it just seems like you're a million miles away, she said. What's on your mind? I stopped by to see Dad today, I said. He told me the rest of his story. I briefly remembered what he'd told me. Wow, she said. Remind me never to get on his bad side. I chuckled. We'll go see him tomorrow, maybe after I kick your ass on the miniature golf course? Sure, if you want, I said. The next day we played a game of miniature golf, and yes, she beat me. And no, I didn't let her. She would have realized that right away. Later, we went to Daddy's house. She took her bag with her and carried it to the nursing home. His eyes lit up when he saw us coming in. Hello, young lady, he said as she hugged him tightly. I have something for you she said, holding out a paper bag to him. He opened it and pulled out a plastic blanket container that contained an afghan. She helped him open it and pulled out the afghan. 
I just finished these the other day, she said. I know you like Afghans, so I made one for you. He smiled, holding it in his hands. It's wonderful, he said. Thank you, I really like it. He turned to look at me. Son, if you don't marry this girl, I will, he declared. You're right, Pops, I said. I took one of Karen's hands in mine and knelt down in front of her, right next to Grandpa. I looked into her eyes. Karen, I said. I love you madly, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Will you marry me? She looked surprised at first, but then she smiled broadly. She put her arms around my neck and kissed my face. Oh, yes, Trey, she said. I'm going to marry you. I love you so much. I love you too, I said. We heard clapping from the door, and when we turned around, we saw several nurses clapping and smiling. Dad joined in too. A couple months later, we were married, and the nursing home brought my grandfather to the church so he could celebrate with us. He handed me an envelope containing first-class airfare to Las Vegas and a reservation at the best hotel. After a few months, his health deteriorated so badly that he was moved to the hospice wing of the nursing home. Karen and I spent as much time with him as we could. I could see that although his body was shutting down, his mind was still very active. I could also tell that he no longer felt any guilt for what he had done. On my last visit, he was sane enough to tell me that he had made his peace with God and was ready to join his beloved Patricia. Don't cry for me, son, he said quietly. We'll be together again. I promise. I love you, son. I hugged him as he let out his last breath. I couldn't hold back. I cried. I love you too, Daddy, I said between sobs. As I looked up at his face, I saw the easy, mischievous smile I had grown to love since I was a child, and I knew he was in a better place. Karen came into the house and hugged me as we both mourned his passing. He was buried in uniform with full military honors next to his wife, Patricia. The honor guard carefully folded the flag that draped his coffin and handed it to me along with a salute. He had fought for his country and deserved all the honors due him, I thought. A few days later, I received a letter from his lawyer asking me to stop by his office. I was curious to know what he wanted, so I went. Your grandfather left you everything, the lawyer said. The house, the money, everything. All in all, it's a substantial sum, even after his last expenses. If you'd like, I can assign you a financial advisor to help you manage it. He also asked me to give you this, he added, handing me a large sealed envelope that looked rather old. It's been stored in my safe for several years now. Don't ask me what's in it because I have no idea. Your grandfather said it could only be opened after he died. Thank you, I said. And yes, I'd like to meet with your financial advisor, I added, seeing the rather substantial amount of money Dad had left behind. I didn't open the envelope until after I got home. I was shocked at what I discovered. It seemed Pops had kept everything, including a copy of a report written by James Hamm and a yellow divorce certificate declaring him free from one Doris Harrison, nay Hastings, on the grounds of abandonment. There was even a photograph of the house in which they lived. That night, Karen and I went through it all, shaken. I guess everything my dad had told me was true. The last sheet turned out to be a photocopy of some old official report in Russian. It seemed to be something from a giant stash of documents issued by the old Soviet KGB. It had an English translation attached to it. As far as I could tell, it was a series of field reports by a certain Svetlana Fedorova, in which she informed her superiors in Moscow that she suspected that her target, that is the Pope, might know her real identity. Her early reports stated only that she had become intimate with a man very familiar with American atomic weapons work. She never called Pops by name, but it was clear that she was frustrated that she could not get anything useful out of him and told her superiors that all he wanted to do was have sex and watch capitalist television. Later dispatches revealed even more frustration. Her superiors were telling her that she should be more aggressive in her actions. In the last dispatch, she reported that she and Michelle were planning something drastic. I'll deal with him at the first opportunity, she told her superiors. Karen and I had a good laugh about that. The KGB report said that neither Fedorova nor her German-born assistant were ever heard from again. They even speculated that the two had run off to get married, but they just couldn't be found. The operation was stamped deceased. They have no idea, I said, making Karen laugh. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.